Tune in to Power 102 FM at 11.30 a.m. this Wednesday for a special edition of the Business Forum with Communications Specialist Sandrine Rattan. Her guest is Dr. Brian Branch, President and Chief Executive Officer of the World Council of Credit Unions located in Wisconsin, USA. The topic is the global evolution of the credit union movement. That's the Business Forum. The Business Forum. This Wednesday at 11.30 a.m. Sponsored by Venture Credit Union and heard exclusively on Power 102 FM. All right, and of course, that is exactly where we are right now in the, the business forum. And of course, it is being, it is coming to you to see the people out there at Venture Credit Union. Of course, our host inside this evening, this morning is Sandrine Rattan. I haven't heard from Sandrine for a little while, but it's good to have her. Sandrine, good morning and welcome. I'm here, Sir Charles. Thanks for having me. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. And it is indeed a beautiful morning here in our Twin Island Republic. And, you know, special greetings to our listeners on the World Wide Web, as well as officials and members of the credit union movement who are tuned into the program at this time. This morning, we are bringing to you a very special edition of the Business Forum with the kind compliments of Venter Credit Union. And we'll be focusing on the credit union movement in a global context. As you all may be aware, the Credit Union Month will be observed in October. And this is the first in a series of media activities which will be hosted as part of this observance. And I'm pleased to have as my guest, Dr. Brian Branch, President and CEO of the World Council of Credit Unions located in Wisconsin, United States. And Dr. Branch will no doubt enlighten our listeners on the latest developments taking place within the movement. But before introducing my guest, I'd like to share his profile with you. Dr. Brian Branch was appointed president and CEO of the World Council of Credit Unions in 2011, but he has worked with the World Council since 1990 and has held several positions. He has developed programs to update and expand the savings-based financial services of credit unions worldwide. Dr. Branch has also provided service and product development assistance for savings tailored credit products and transaction service networks, as well as designing international financial network systems. He has also undertaken credit union development assignments in Afghanistan, Argentina, Bangladesh, Barbados, Bolivia, Cambodia, Chile, China, Colombia, Costa Rica, Croatia, East Timor, El Salvador, Ethiopia, Ghana, Grenada, and that is just a few of the countries in which Dr. Brandt has provided his, his credit union expertise. He also holds a PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a Master's of Arts in Latin American Studies from the University of Texas, Austin. He also holds a Bachelor of Arts in Government and Spanish. There you have it, listeners, a very impressive profile of Dr. Brand Branch. So we go straight in line to Dr. Branch. Good morning, Dr. Branch, and a warm welcome to our shows here in Trinidad and Tobago and on the Business Forum, which is a special edition we're doing just for you. A warm welcome, sir. Well, good morning. Thank you for letting me join you. Yes. Dr. Branch, before getting into the full details of our discussions, could you provide our listeners with a brief overview of the World Council of Credit Unions, which is commonly known as WACU, and perhaps in your response, speak a bit on the organization's mandate. The World Council of Credit Unions is established about 42 years ago to promote, support, to represent, to defend, to promote, uh, serve the worldwide credit union movement. So we serve as a global trade association for credit unions, and we serve as a development organization for credit unions. You can find credit unions in 100 countries around the world, about 56,000 credit unions, and uh, they serve about uh, 201 million members around the world. Yes. Dr. Branch, that is a huge task. You sitting at the helm. Um, Tell me, just um, for interest, what is your employee base at WorkU? And talking in the context of the volume of work that you have, which you have just alluded to in terms of the number of credit unions that you represent. If you 
you look at the number of employees of the World Council, we have uh, probably about uh, 50 employees in the United States. We have another 120 employees in different uh, parts of the world. Uh, but uh, really, we look at the members of the World Council, the national associations in various countries, uh, and their employees who we draw upon and use as well to do the work that we do around the world. So we're a large system, lots of, uh, lots of countries, lots of different credit unions, and they, as part of the cooperative system, uh, help pool their resources, their members, their uh, employees, their directors, uh, to help provide assistance one to another. Excellent, excellent. Dr. Blanche, I'd like to spend some time analyzing in part a very important media statement which you issued recently. Um, you, state, you started by stating that the benefits of credit unions have become more obvious to consumers as they seek out the best financial options. And in my own analysis of that, it is indeed, you know, a, prong, a, a profound statement, and I suspect it has to do with the types of positive experiences usually enjoyed by credit union movements. Explain for us, please. Well, if we go to the mission of any credit union, wherever it is, the uh, mission of the credit union is to champion the common person. They're to provide services to the ordinary person on the street. And they, we specialize in financial services. What credit unions need to do by their mission and their mandate is to do what's right by the members. So when we interview people around the world and we ask them what their credit union has done for them, what people remember is that the credit union may have helped them improve their life for the life of their family. It gave them support when other institutions uh, wouldn't have. Uh, very often, uh, they may they may have been rural residents where the institutions didn't, other institutions didn't see them as a profitable market to serve, or it may have been people who were starting out a, a small business, starting out in their professional life, and it was the credit union that helped provide them with that that initial step. Support that, that launched them on their career. What we find uh, when we interview members of credit unions and we ask them what would stimulate their loyalty or what they remember, why they stayed with their credit union, is when people saw that the credit union gave them the alternative, which was the best alternative for them versus what was most profitable for the credit union. And so when we talk about a credit union difference, we can talk about capital structure, we can talk about financial structure, but really it boils down to this philosophical commitment to give the member that financial empowerment, give them that service which is best for their interests as opposed to what might be the most profitable for the credit union. And so people see that uh, when they compare the fees uh, across institutions or the uh, quality of service or the follow-up, the long-term relationship they develop with their credit union, um, or the comparative interest rates. Yes, and I think Dr. Branch is all about changing lives of the members in the context of that personal touch which they feel from credit unions in terms of the services offered. That's, that's absolutely right. I mean, what makes it uh, concrete, practical for people. You can talk all you want about philosophical differences, but people look to see you really carry out the action right. uh, behind, behind that philosophy. All right. All right. Dr. Branch, you also alluded in that same statement to the fact that the recent um, global crime the recent global crisis highlighted the difference between member-owned credit unions and for-profit banking options. And again, I think that is all tied into um, the comments that you just alluded to in terms of that personalized service. But if you could just share a bit, particularly in the issue with regards to the global financial crisis. Well, this has been a very interesting learning period for all of us in credit unions. And... Uh, Certainly the financial crisis and the worldwide recession impacted lots of different countries, different populations, 
in different degrees of severity and in, in rolling waves across the world. But what we saw was that Koreans stood out because they helped consumers through the financial crisis and the recession. We saw people move their money to Korea unions because it, uh, they were looking for a safe place. We saw that Korea unions were impacted as people lost their jobs or someone in the household lost their job and Korea unions then worked to help uh, re re reestablish the terms of mortgages and keep people in their homes. They help people work through those hard times. Uh, Korea unions continue to provide financing to small and rural communities and to small businesses for people who are self-employed. And we saw a lot of the other larger commercial institutions pull away and stop providing financing to those, ki those kinds of activities. Um, some of our larger, for example, Wall Street institutions certainly gained notoriety for consumer views, high fees, and uh, restricted credit, and uh, access to government bailouts. Whereas credit unions, on the other hand, achieved a positive perception by providing a fairer treatment and a more supportive treatment for their members. So that's all great to uh, compare history. But what is, what's been the real impact of that? We've seen record growth in membership in credit unions over the last uh, two or three years now. Um, and it's, it's been everywhere. Yes. In the United Kingdom, they've had tremendous growth. Uh, in Poland, in uh, Latin America, in the United States, consumers were very distrustful, very angry with financial institutions after the financial crisis. People lost their savings jobs, their homes, their pensions, and then when they were most vulnerable, uh, the large commercial institutions gave them large fee increases. So we saw large numbers of consumers close their accounts in the commercial banking sector and moved to credit. And so we had uh, Bank Transfer Day in 2012. We had a huge number of people. So we had probably about 1.7 new uh, 1.7 million new credit union members in 2011. We had about 2 million new credit union members in 2012. And that growth continues today. In the, uh, certainly in the U.S., we've seen growth in uh, credit unions in Canada and Australia. A tremendous growth in Brazil. And I'm sure that growth is ongoing, Dr. Branch. It is, and it brings its own challenges. Um, people are looking for uh, a place where they can access a full package of financial services. And uh, today, people are looking for convenience and access. They want to be able to access their accounts in the moment they want to and in the place where they want to. And so uh, it's, a, it's a challenge for any institution, and the credit unions to keep up this kind of momentum have to provide that kind of full package of services and convenience. Yes. Dr. Branch, please hold your thoughts while we take a short commercial break. We return to you shortly and we will be discussing a couple of the issues that emanated from the recent World Credit Union Conference held in Ottawa. And of course, you are listening to the Business Forum, where you can see a bunch of credit union right here on Power 2.1 FM. And, and I'm sorry, the, the sound is uh, very weak on this end. I think you're asking about the conference that we recently had in Ottawa. Yes, and I'm say yes, and I'm saying that you know some important pieces of information, including legislative matters, were discussed. And how would you briefly describe these in the context of the way forward for the movement? Absolutely. the The conference in Ottawa is our annual gathering of the tribes, and uh, every year we provide a forum for creating systems all over the world to come together and talk about what are the pressing challenges, what are the uh, current day trends that are affecting them most, what kinds of best practices can they learn from each other. We bring in experts to 
uh, help provide information on what's happening. So we have about uh, 60 countries present there this year. Every year we're in a different part of the world. Last year we were in Poland. This year we're in Canada. Next year we're in Australia. And it gives every region an opportunity to maximize their participation. If we look at what are the common trends and challenges that Caribbean face today that we build these kinds of events around, uh, one is legislation and regulation. So we all saw the abuses that led to the global financial crisis, and the result is that uh, government uh, put in place much more strict and rigorous legislation and regulation uh, to protect consumers and to prevent the kinds of of financial impairments in the financial institutions that we saw. So that uh, expanded rigor of prudential supervision we absolutely support. However, it brings with it an increased compliance burden. It, it becomes very expensive for credit unions to meet all these reporting requirements, uh, different ways of doing business, and the danger of that is that it makes it less affordable, less feasible, to provide services to low-income low populations, people who work with small savings accounts, small loans. When you add the compliance costs to that, it makes those services more expensive, either to those consumers or to the institution. So we do a lot of uh, examination of what those rules are. We look at uh, effective strategies to efficiently meet those costs of that supervision and how to continue providing services to the lower and moderate income populations who are most affected yes. by uh, that increased supervision. Now we look at some of the other uh, challenges and trends in the market today. And uh, in financial services, a lot of it is about what's happening with payment systems, and mobile banking, and social media. Yes. These are today's greatest forces of business disruption and redefinition of financial services, the changes in technology. Um, so we look at uh, image systems, electronic wallets. We looked at mobile banking. We brought in experts to talk about where that technology is going, what the future looks like, how creatives need to adapt. We brought in creatives that, are, that can explain how they've tackled this and what they're doing in providing those services. And then we try to look a little bit further ahead and uh, where we're going to be, what we're going to be facing in two or three years. And we look at social media, where that's taking us in terms of branding and marketing and the driving business. If we look at the high growth markets where the Cretans are achieving the highest growth, it's the ones who offer those multiple channels of payments and mobile technology. They have mobile banking channels. They're active on social media. And the mobile transactions which you do on your phone uh, are rapidly overtaking the, over, the online or the web-based transactions, which overtook the in-person branch transactions some time ago. As the internet becomes increasingly available, and it's cheaper and it's faster, transactions and business shift to the internet, and people can access that internet with their mobile device. Dr. Branch, in terms of, I know a lot of important issues, as I said before, um, emanated from the conference, but in terms of the action items, such as what you have just alluded to, um, I guess what you would be responsible for the oversight in terms of making, it, making those things happen, is it that? In terms of the so, credit union system? So we're, give, we're given some active roles and some facilitation roles. In the active roles, we're given a very clear mandate in the issues of legislative advocacy. A lot of the standards that are set now for legislation and regulation for financial institutions come from some of the international bodies. So it's difficult for one country to open those doors and sit at the table. And so we come as a representative of many countries we interface with the Bank for International Settlements and the, and the Basel Capital Courts, and we uh, discuss, we help try to influence standards that are set in terms of uh, 
mutual institution shares and capital requirements. We work with the Financial Stability Board, and it sets, uh, for example, the legal identity identification system, the, the logging system for every financial transaction, which can be traced back to the source and everyone that had a part in those transactions. And so we talk to them about what this means in practical terms when you have to to put an identification number on every single transaction, what that means in terms of the paperwork requirement and how you certify that. Or the Financial Action Task Force, how the money laundering, anti-money laundering requirements can, can be made simpler, more streamlined, easier for a cooperative, community-based institution who knows their members. But we don't look to contravene the standards. We look to find ways that are cost-effective for uh, smaller and community-based institutions uh, to meet those standards. In terms of facilitation, um, every credit union is going to find their approach to payment systems, mobile banking, and the task that we take on as a facilitator is to build working groups so that credit unions can share information with each other and with vendors, technology companies, in terms of what are the best practices, uh, options out there for providing this kind of te technological development for great unions to meet consumers' demands, convenience, and service. Dr. Branch, we are close to the end, unfortunately, but I just want to comment from you. Um, you know, from all what you have alluded to, so what the credit union movement represents worldwide. The, the movement has evolved to me into a one-stop shop where members are able to access a full suite of services, consumer loans to mortgages, from basic savings to major investments, and the list continues. Now, having said that, do you foresee a major fallout in the for the for-profit financial institutions? Well, the truth is I do not. Uh, frankly, the market continues to uh, grow. The market grows. Uh, either the growth in the banking, the commercial for profit banking sector, or in the credit union sector. And so there's lots of room for growth for everybody. The uh, is as there's more convenience, as there's um, more opportunities for financial services. Uh, there's a lot of demand uh, that is still unmet out there, and there's a lot of demand. So we're also seeing the banking sector, the commercial sector, growing as well. But what's happening within that growth? When you look at the sector, or you look at the credit sector, a lot of that growth is in the institutions that offer the, the full package of services and offer the various channels of access. Online access through the internet, the mobile banking through the cell phone, and the access through social media. Those are the institutions that are growing within both the banking sector and the for-profit sector. Now what you see is a shift of, of uh, population. Um, People who are frustrated with the service uh, or the cost of the for-profit institutions, and they shift over to work. Shift of people who don't get the full range of bank bank for credit that provides a broader. So what we're seeing uh, growth. Cooperative sector to industries. Yes. Yes. So, Brad, as we approach the end, what would be some of your closing thoughts? Because I know we have um, our local credit unions here in Trinidad and Tobago, most of them. So, you know, come to the end, as I said, unfortunately, but what would be some of your thoughts of going forward? I've been to Trinidad and Tobago and times for the few years since I've been there. 
very high regard for them. Great innovation. Not the Koreans and Trinidad is that uh, you know they need to keep on doing the great service that they're doing. They need to innovate. They need to look at the market trends. And uh, you know, I said at the beginning, Koreans are about championing the common person, and uh, they do a great job of that. And the common person wants the same kind of quality of service and breadth of products that your well-off person does. Koreans do well by responding to those demands for the breadth of services and products, and at the same time, uh, need to innovate and provide that convenience that people are looking for through the channels of banking, the online service. But what's different? What's different is what we want to enhance, serve. We want to use that as our strength. One of the things that we talked a lot about last year in Poland, this year in Ottawa, we say we're different. We need to live the policy. We need to make it practical and show the benefit to the members. Excellent. Dr. Branch, it was indeed a pleasure having you on our shows here um, as our guest on this special edition of the Business Forum. You have indeed quite a great insight into, um, you know, the, the, the union movement and the way forward, sharing some of the important issues which were placed table at the World Credit Union. Some more media initiatives lined up of Credit Union Month in October. We'll be chatting with you again, you know, to invite you to be part of it. Again, thank you very, very much, and we'll chat soon. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. you... There you have it, listeners, Dr. Brian Branch, President and CEO of the World Council of Credit Unions, our guest on this special edition of the Business Forum. As I said, he, you know, he provided a deep insight to um, the way forward for the credit union movement and a lot of food for thought. Um, as I said, bring some more media initiatives in observance of credit unions, and hopefully Dr. Branch will be part of that. You'll hear more. You'll hear more from us. So stay tuned to Power 1 FM and goodbye for now.